and we have lined up three experts on neurology on three very important and interesting topics. To start with, I'd like to invite Dr. Gamini Patirana, consultant neurologist from the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, to talk about approach to acute headache in adults. Over to you, Dr. Gamini. So, introduction. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, uh, now, to start the topic, uh, this picture that you are seeing here actually depicts two things. One is a patient with a headache and also a doctor who has finished taking history from a patient with headache, probably. Uh, well, let's go to the uh, acute headache. What are the things that we should know? Uh, this is a common symptom. Patients do present to emergency and sometimes they present to outpatient department. In fact, in the emergency visits, up to 2 to 4 percent are due to uh, headaches. And out of these headaches, we know majority are benign and minority will be having a serious cause, maybe up to about 19 percent. And the main task in the emergency actually is to uh, distinguish this minority serious group from the majority benign group. And the tools that we have for anything else like uh, history, examination, plus some investigations like neuroimaging, lumbar puncture, maybe ultrasound and a couple of blood tests and so on. Uh, before we move on, these two terms I may be using in my presentation. To those of who you have not heard these two terms, the primary and secondary headaches. Uh, when you say secondary headaches, usually there is a demonstrable pathology or etiology is there, either a CT scan or a blood test or some uh, lumbar puncture results may show some etiology. And primary headache is where usually you don't have demonstrable uh, pathologies like migraine, tension headaches, cluster headaches. Usually they are recurrent and going on for a number of years probably. Now this is a uh, data set from a, a cross section of a patients who have come to emergency for headache. And at the end of the evaluation, the diagnosis that they had, um, you can see that uh, 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 most of them are primary headaches, 54 percent, and uh, there's significant group of secondary headaches also here. And you can see secondary headaches also has certain benign pathologies under that, plus serious pathologies as well. So uh, the, the cross section of the patients who are coming to emergency can vary from various hospitals, but here it's about 50%, 54% and 42%. But certain instances we have seen about 80% of primary headaches, 80 to 90% and the rest being secondary headaches. So this uh, primary headaches and the secondary uh, benign secondary headaches, usually we, after evaluation, we get them to the OPD, outpatient department or the clinic and serious pathologies needs attention for further workup and uh, necessary action. And in the emergency setting, a patient with headache, uh, they are with pain, so you must relieve the pain as well. And on the other hand, you must work up for a, looking for a cause. Now, it's very difficult to assess a patient who is in pain, so maybe relieving pain should happen concurrently while you are working up the patient. And uh, there, are, there may be certain myths among ourselves, misconceptions, that severe headache indicates serious underlying etiology always. But it may not be always. Of course, when you have severe headache, uh, like thundercap headache, very severe headache, sometimes you might have to look for a cause. But it doesn't mean that all severe headaches or thunderclap headaches will end up having a serious etiology. And gradual onset headache must have a benign etiology, may not be true always. Sometimes gradual onset headaches can have a serious pathology also. And when the headache is uh, responsive to your treatment, you feel a little reassuring that thinking that maybe the etiology is not serious. That also may not be true. You can have good response to your treatment. Your patient may become headache free, but still you can have a serious underlying pathology. Now, this is the trajectory of the headaches that they come with. On the left hand side, you see a sharp rise in the severity of the headache within a couple of seconds or minutes where it's acute severe headache. When you call it thunderclap headache, when this uh, onset to peak uh, arrives within a minute, if it takes longer than a minute, you call it acute severe headache. And then on the other hand, in the middle, you see 
recent onset persistent progressive headache. And on the right hand side you see patients come with acute headache but you ask from the patient the patient had previous episodic headache. Maybe at the background there was migraine, tension headache or, or a cluster headache and then currently the patient is presenting with acute headache. Now this group, the third group, uh, the ED doctor has to decide whether this, this headache is different or similar to the previous headache. If it is similar, probably you might manage as the same ongoing headache episode or if you think it's a different headache or uh, maybe a thunderclap headache or acute severe headache, you may wonder whether there's something else is going on. So you might work towards one of the two uh, trajectories that you have shown in the left hand side. So this third group, actually you can have two etiologies. So you have to decide which one the patient is going to be worked with. So usually the first two groups will end up having come into the emergency setting. In our setting, of course, they get admitted to hospitals. And uh, other group, of course, may see in the outpatient setting or may come to the uh, emergency as well. If you look at the causes of these three groups, the acute severe headache or thunderclap headache, uh, of course, you need to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then uh, this second one is actually reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, which is a fairly new entity, not exactly new, but uh, that's a benign cause of acute thunderclap headache. And pituitary apoplexy, intracerebral hemorrhage, dissection of the carotids. Uh, though the dissection of the carotid takes place in the carotids, sometimes they can come with headache. Meningitis and colloid cyst of the third ventricle. Maybe carbon monoxide poisoning, the patient come from an area where there was fire or uh, 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 engine had been started in a closed space or something like that. Uh, workmates, group of people coming with headaches. Uh, and the middle group, you have giant cell arthritis, venous sinus thrombosis, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, spontaneous cases of hypotension, uh, meningitis, brain abscess, brain tumor, and subdural hematoma, and so on. And on the other hand, you have the primary headache syndromes. So how do you work them up? So when a patient comes with headache, you need to look for clues in the history and examination, which I will show you in a short while. And uh, certain clues like say, for example, there was a neck jerk or uh, after a chiropractory or, or maybe a, a pregnant lady. So what circumstances and clues may indicate or give a hint towards a particular diagnosis, in which case, when the clue is present, you work up them in the appropriate diagnostic pathway. And if no clue is available, patient come with severe headache or uh, significant headache. The SNOOP test, SNOOP, SNOOP 10, I will show up in the next slide, is actually the red flags of headaches. There you need to work up. Now SNOOP 10 I have put up here. Even though patient in his history does not tell any clues towards a particular diagnosis, you are supposed to ask and look for this SNOOP 10. SNOOP 10 I have got from the up to date. If you search on the internet, you will give the abbreviation or the mnemonic SNOOP 10 stands for a uh, list of uh, red flags where you are supposed to work them up rather than discharging. So if that is there, then appropriate testing with either imaging or lumbar puncture and so on. So that's in a nutshell how the patients will be worked up. What are the clues in the history? It's very important to find out what were the circumstances at the onset of the headache. If that happens after uh, lumbar puncture. Yes, lumbar punctures are done for diagnostic purposes and anesthesia for cesarean section and or maybe for uh, surgeries and post trauma together with fever. Sometimes systemic fevers can give rise to headache and postpartum and peripartum you might think of uh, venous sinus thrombosis uh, following chiropractic treatment or neck jerks you may think of carotid dissection. So if you have this history you have a clue towards a particular diagnosis. And associated clinical features like uh, headache is associated with uh, dropped level of consciousness, uh, seizures, focal deficit, all these indicate a, towards a particular diagnosis. So you will accordingly work up the patient. And past medical problems also will be useful. If the new onset headache comes with a history of a background cancer or maybe background HIV will be useful for us in getting a clue towards a diagnosis. And examination also you must look for clues. Ocular examination is very important. You will have a lot of clues in the ocular examinations like Horner syndrome might indicate dissection of the internal carotid. Uh, you are aware that the sympathetic to the pupil goes around the carotid artery. 
and complete third nerve palsy might suggest it's a aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery and visual field defects especially bitemporal hemianopia might indicate pituitary apoplexy and disc edema or papilledema might suggest um, space occupying lesion intracranial hypertension so on and cerebellar signs has to be looked for and you might not pick it up unless you examine the patient might suggest cerebellar hemorrhage and also you must palpate the temporal arteries especially in a patient who is older than 50 years may include it, it may give, be a clue for giant cell arthritis and of course neck rigidity neck stiffness uh, in fact it should be neck stiffness rigidity is different it's again a feature of meningitis or meningismus from a subarachnoid hemorrhage and rashes uh, you all have seen meningococcal septicemia has to be suspected and antibiotics should be immediately started. So you go through the uh, workup and that's the SNOOP 10 danger signs or red flags. Even if the patient does not have a clue in the history of examination, you must actively ask these things and look for these things. Again, some of them are repetition of the same things, but you must look for them. If any of them are there, of course, you need to work up them for, uh, 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 for, a, for a course. And next tool that we have is brain imaging. Either you will do a CT scan or a MRI scan. And non-contrast CT is quite useful in acute situation. Uh, they say uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, if you suspect, and the patient presents within six hours of onset of the headache, there's about 99% chance of picking up on the CT scan, provided you have a hematocrit of more than 30 and uh, the CT scan was read by a radiologist looking for subarachnoid blood. And of course, intracerebral hemorrhage, pituitary apoplexy, and all these things will be picked up on a CT scan. I will show you a couple of CT scans as I go along. Now, you can see on the left hand side, you have subarachnoid blood uh, in the subarachnoid spaces that's whitish in the sulci. And on the middle, you see intracerebral hemorrhage. And on the right side, you see transverse sinus thrombosis. So these are all in non-contrast CT scan. Let's have a look at another one. On the left side, I'm not sure whether you can recognize that there's a midline shift here. And also there is a subdural collection, which is isodense to the brain parenchyma. So that's isodense SDH. And also uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm with a subarachnoid bleeding on the right hand side. You can see the interhemispheric fissure there is blood and also the aneurysm is shown up in the in the down arrow this was actually uh, passed as a normal ct and picked up by the radiologist so it's very important that when you are having a patient with headache if you do a non-contrast ct and the ct looks normal of course you must get it read by a radiologist because on the console sometimes they can easily differentiate uh, whether blood is there and uh, we, they can do windowing and they can adjust uh, the Im images and look better. Uh, it's, it's not correct if you look at the CT and you think the CT is normal and pass it uh, that the normal CT and later the radiology report says it's abnormal. So the radiology report says subarachnoid hemorrhage, then there will be a problem. So always if you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage, the patient with acute headache, better to get a, a CT scan seen by the radiologist even though it looks normal and the other thing uh, even if the CT scan is normal by the radiologist it doesn't rule out serious etiologies that's another misconception people have normal CT rules out most of the serious causes and lumbar puncture is the other tool that we have uh, it should be performed in all unusual or persistent headaches whether the onset was sudden or progressive and we are trying to pick up meningitis and hypertensions and hypotensions within the CSF space. And uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is uh, missed in CT scan in about 5% if you do it within 24 hours. And uh, so that 5% will be picked up by the CSF. We are looking for red blood cells and xanthochromia. And xanthochromia is pathognomonic of subarachnoid bleeding. Uh, lumbar puncture performed usually after the non-contrast CT brain because, uh, because of the concern that the, there may be a tumor or increased intracranial pressure. The moment you do the lumbar puncture, the patient may cone. So because of that, there's this concern that you must have a NCCT brain before going for the lumbar puncture. 
but it may not be so if when you are suspecting meningitis in a patient who is conscious normal conscious level and fundoscopy does not show any papilledema or there is no focal deficit and we don't wait for non-contrast CT you can go for lumbar puncture but otherwise if you have if you suspect uh, raised intracranial pressure of course you should go for an image before going for the lumbar puncture and uh, usually CSF is taken for four tubes and you will be looking for RBC counts and the xanthochromia xanthochromia means bilirubin in the CSF and traumatic tap is the next question when you are doing lumbar puncture you are looking for blood and seen about 30% but this percentage can change depending on the you know, environment and the person who is doing it so uh, there were two parameters that we looked for um, whether we should look for uh, the RBC count in the first and the fourth the comparison of the two four tubes or whether we should look for the absolute count in the fourth tube and this particular article says absolute count in the fourth tube is superior in picking up whether this is a traumatic tap or whether it's subarachnoid hemorrhage so they say if the red cell red cell count in the fourth tube is more than 2000 it suggests uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage if it's less it, uh, with no xanthochromia uh, sh ruled out and other investigations you may go for carotid ultrasound looking for dissection and um, transcranial doppler also had been described in in, in things like uh, uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome and the next tool that we have of course is mri brain and people used to ask for mri brain headache protocol uh, but headache protocol should include all these uh, sequences but uh, if you just ask headache protocol in our setting sri lankan setting they may not do all of them and if you do all of them it will be a big cost patient will be in the machine for a longer period but depending on what you suspect, you need to specifically ask for various sequences. Otherwise, just writing headache protocol, they may not be doing all of them. Now, for example, if you do not do the fat saturation, axial, cervical, and cerebral sequences, you are not going to pick up the arterial dissection. So, so you need to specifically ask for various sequences. And uh, digital subtraction angiography, if the per patient has persistent headache with subarachnoid hemorrhage, you are still suspecting an aneurysm that's the gold standard you might have to go for that if you are strongly suspecting irrespective of uh, uh, other negative results depending on the time i will line up a couple of cases uh, the uh, chairperson will let me know if, if i'm running out of time the first case is a 45 year old woman with a history of migraine at the background and a recent diagnosis of hyper hypertension presented with a two-day history of increasing headache. She had taken over-the-counter medications with some relief. On the second day, the patient awoke with terrible pain located in the occiput and radiating to the forehead, associated with photophobia, nausea, and vomiting. The headache was unlike uh, any she had ever experienced. Physical examination revealed dehydration, dehydrated, distressed woman with a blood pressure of 180 by 120, pulse of 110, and temperature 36.1 with no neurological deficit now uh, now the key words here actually is the patient was awakened in the morning with the headache which was very severe and felt at the occiput and she had never experienced such a severe headache she had a headache a little few days ago and uh, the blood pressure is high now high blood pressure rarely can be the cause of the headache but uh, if you think the patient is in having malignant hypertension, but otherwise high blood pressure may not be the cause of the headache. It's just the effect of the pain. Sometimes blood pressure can go up when the patient is having pain. And we did a CT scan. The diagnosis is obvious. The subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see subarachnoid blood in the sylvian fissure, into hemispheric fissure, and so on. Now, uh, now within six hours from the onset, I said 99% positive rate. If you non-contrast CT. Uh, where the hematocrit is more than 30 and the CT scan is a, a later generation good CT scanner and where the radiologist looking at the CT scan uh, with the intention of looking for subarachnoid blood the, the picking up rate is 99% but up to 25% it dropped to 95% uh, but sometimes the CT scan which looks normal to you and me the radiologist might report later that the patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage now this is the case uh, this is a two T CT scan shows uh, convex cell subarachnoid hemorrhage. You see this subarachnoid blood in the uh, uh, sulci, uh, few sulci, very subtle. And when the blood is uh, next to the bone, bone also is white. And sometimes very difficult for us 
uh, clinicians to look at the printed image and say uh, there is uh, uh, subarachnoid blood or not. So that it's always better to get the radiologist to report on the CT. So this is convexal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which can happen from not usually from aneurysms, but they are usually by posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, amyloid angiopathy, and so on. So always better to get this non-contrast CT reported by the radiologist when you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is what we are talking about, not the traumatic ones where head injury causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. So classically it's occipital headache and atypical presentations can occur. So you need to be aware uh, just because you don't have occipital headache, thunderclap headache, acute severe headache may not rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you have to be very careful in picking up the atypical ones because this is a killer and this happens with young people. So you have a lower threshold in picking up subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially if the patient has uh, neck pain, seizures, meningismus. And look at the fundus if you see subhyoid hemorrhage. Not everyone with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have subhyoid hemorrhage, but if you have it, that favors towards subarachnoid hemorrhage. And 50% of them have normal neurological examination as well. And rupture aneurysm is accounting for about 80, 85%. And if you treat them, the case fatality drops to 18%. If you do not treat, the case fatality is about 60%. And also there may be other causes other than aneurysms also. Now that's also another uh, common uh, presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is called perimesencephalic hemorrhage, which is a benign condition actually. About 90% of them will not have a surgical cause, uh, but the cause is actually unknown. But the small percentage can have a uh, aneurysm, so we need to do angiogram if you suspect an aneurysm here. And there can be other causes also, other than aneurysmal uh, uh, causes for um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, let's have another. I'm just lining up a couple of cases to uh, you know uh, discuss the various causes that presents to ED. So here's a 50-year-old woman, previously healthy, presenting with four episodes of thunderclap headaches. Of course, when you hear it, you always think this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. She described a sudden onset occipital severe headache. The headaches were associated with vomiting. She reported worsening of headache by straining and lifting objects. Pain lasted for up to about two hours on each occasion. She had a couple of times. The episodes were several days apart. She found no relief from paracetamol. She denied any confusion, fever, visual symptoms or seizures. Uh, her neurology was normal, GCS and temperature is normal, blood pressure is um, 160-90 and uh, uh, rest of it is normal. And uh, her CSF including the opening pressure also is normal and her urgent non-contrast CT brain also is normal. You might wonder what this problem is. The key words here actually, she had four episodes of thunderclap headache, few days apart, not just one. If you see few uh, episodes of thunderclap headache, you must suspect uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. And this patient did not have subarachnoid blood in the CSF and CT scan also did not show any subarachnoid blood. But because subarachnoid hemorrhage is a possibility in this patient, we went ahead with MRA, uh, magnetic resonance angiogram. And what you see is uh, spasms of the arteries. You see this uh, uh, multifocal segmental spasm. This is called uh, uh, sausage in string uh, appearance. Uh, so reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is likely when you see this. But you have a differential diagnosis of cerebral angiitis also when you see this. So to differentiate is very difficult. But the clinical picture is more in favor of RCVS. And when you have a question of differentiating angiitis and RCVS, you have a clinical tool, clinical instrument, uh, looking for uh, whether it's RCVS or not. And the clinical instrument also is called RCVS too. So we have two differential diagnoses and that's the clinical tool that we have, uh, RCVS2. And if the score in this tool is more than five, uh, it's likely to be reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So our patient actually had a recurrent single uh, thunderclap headache. So he has five marks there. And you see the carotid uh, intracranial narrowing is there. So two marks there, already seven. 
and uh, she's a female so eight marks so this patient's likely to have a rcvs so we did not work up towards uh, NGITs, but we did a follow-up MRA and we demonstrated that that was re re reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is a benign condition. Rarely it can cause strokes and various disability, extremely rarely can cause death as well. Um, reversible segmental narrowing of the cerebral arteries and they usually present with thunderclap headache with probably neurological deficits related to brain edema or stroke. Um, sometimes they can cause convexial subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. And digital substitution angiography is the gold standard for diagnosis in condition. And these are again a couple of pictures showing the changes that happen in reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Uh, you can see on the top left, sausage on string appearance, the arteriogram showing spasms. And the middle top, you see the subarachnoid hemorrhage in the convexial subarachnoid hemorrhage and flare dot sign on the right hand side top the dots are actually spasmodic arteries and on the bottom you see the infarcts and the hemorrhages all this can happen rarely with reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome do you have time for another case yeah. Yeah. three minutes okay let's uh, finish with this case so he's a 58 year old woman was referred to neurology second day after the coronary artery bypass surgery with headache with blurry vision in both eyes in the past, she had hypertension, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, and never had ocular symptoms in the past. The usual medications were amlodipine, atovastatin, and aspirin. She is a non-smoker and a teetotaler. She underwent CABG yesterday, as uh, shown before, and noted to has had a period of hypotension during the surgery. She was hemodynamically stable postoperatively. While in the ward, she complained sudden onset headache and blurry vision, nausea, and was treated with IV medications. The blood pressure is normal, heart rate is normal, visual acuity is little uh, low, but pupil was equally reacting and uh, mild uh, 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 RAPD and ocular motility is normal. So here is a patient post CABG, bypass graft surgery, second day coming with severe acute headache and some visual changes. So uh, these are the key words in this presentation. We did the visual field on this patient and found that there was bitemporal hemianopia. So bitemporal hemianopia usually indicates that there's a lesion in the optic chiasm. And uh, we did the CT scan, that was a non-contrast CT. You can see the pituitary area, there's some hyperdensity spot in the middle. And we went ahead with the MRI and shown that the diagnosis was pituitary apoplexy. So the patient has had a pituitary adenoma before undergoing the bypass surgery. And there was hypotension probably leading to uh, necrosis, infarction or hemorrhage. This is what usually happens. And there's expansion taking place in the pituitary area. And if the expansion takes place upwards, it presses on the optic chiasm, giving rise to bitemporal hemianopia. And the expansion takes place sideways. It can press on the, uh, the structures in the cavernous sinus, usually the third nerve, giving rise to diplopia. And expansion downwards can cause CSF, uh, rhinorrhea, and so on. So these are the usual things that can happen with pituitary apoplexy. Um, I think we are. So uh, this is a fourth case. Uh, he's a 19-year-old previously healthy male admitted with headache with fever and uh, no visual disturbances, no vomiting. Examination did not reveal any abnormality. Visual fields were normal. Hematology, biochemistry, X-ray of the skull normal. He was given treatment and was discharged. So he, his headache got better, patient was discharged. We have this uh, preconception when the headache is better, probably it's a, maybe a benign condition. Four days later, he was readmitted with throbbing headache located over the both temporal regions. No nausea, vomiting or visual disturbances, behavioral disturbances, seizures and his Glasgow coma scale was 15. Nervous system examination normal, including ocular exam. He keeps complaining of throbbing headache with episodic worsening in severity. So we have some clues. The patient had come with a second episode of headache here, and uh, we don't have much uh, examination findings to uh, giving rise to any clues, but we feel that there's something serious going on. We went ahead with the CT scan. That's what we saw. If anyone can recognize, uh, this is actually a colloid cyst of the third ventricle. You know, the lateral ventricles joins the third ventricle at the foramen of Munro. That's where the 
this is takes place and it's in the anterior wall so it has a siphon effect at times it blocks the CSF pathway causing headache especially if you lean forwards it tends to block the pathway so the headache can comes on when you lean forward and you know uh, settles when you uh, lean backwards so colloids is the third ventricle uh, is what the diagnosis is. So these are cystic lesions located in the anterior part of the third ventricle close to the foramen of Munro. Uh, patients may remain asymptomatic sometimes for the for life certain patients and others paroxysmal headache, gait disturbances, nausea, vomiting, behavioral changes and sometimes weakness of the lower limbs, impaired memory, uh, new learning disability and some of, sometimes you can have sudden deaths from this and these diagnosis was established in the postmortem. So non-contrast of the brain uh, you see a well-defined round oval non-enhancing lesion. These are colloids, so it looks brighter on the non-contrast CT. Treatment, uh, you have surgical treatment, you either endoscopic resection or microscopic removal by the transcortical, transcalosal endoscopic method. So, so these are the uh, cases that I, uh, so we will stop here and uh, any questions I can answer.